Hi, I'm Sharon, Educational Youth Librarian for Wyndham City Libraries. Welcome back to Chapter 16 of Tomorrow When the War Began by John Marsden. Ali and Lee have discovered photos and papers that belong to the hermit. They also discuss their relationship, even though Ali doesn't want to. Let's read Chapter 16. There were two other documents in the box. One was a letter from Imogen Christie's mother. She wrote, Dear Mr Christie. Mr Christie, Lee commented. And I said, well, they were very formal in those days. I remember receipt of your letter of November 12. Indeed, your position is a difficult one. As you know, I have always stood by you and defended your account of the dreadful deaths of my dear daughter and my dear grandson. It's been the only possible true one. And I've always believed and devoutly prayed it to be so. And I rejoiced, as you know, when the jury pronounced you innocent. For I believe you to have been a man of unjustly accused. And if the law does not know a case such as yours, then more shame on the law, I say. But the jury did the only thing possible, despite what the judge said. And you know I have always held to the one point of view and have said so from one end of the district to the other. I cannot think that I could have done any more. No man, and no woman either, can still wagging tongues. And as if they are as bad as you say and you'll be forced to leave the district, it is a shame, but there is no stopping women once they begin to gossip. And I say it, although I am a traitor to my sex, but there it is. That it is the way of the world, and no doubt always will be. And you know you will always be welcome under the roof of Imogen Emma Egan. The last thing was a poem, a simple poem. In this life of froth and bubble, two things stand like stone. Kindness in another's trouble, courage in your own. When we'd read that, Lee silently wrapped everything up again and replaced it in the tin. It didn't surprise me when he put the tin back in the cavity and dropped the windowsill on top of it. I knew that we weren't necessarily leaving it there forever, to decay into fragments and then dust. But at the moment, there was too much to absorb, too much to think about. We left the hut silently. We left it to its silence. Halfway back along the creek, I turned to face Lee, who was splashing along behind me. It was about the only spot in the cool tunnel of green where we could stand. I put my hands around the back of his neck and kissed him hungrily. After a moment of shock, when his lips felt numb, he began kissing me back, pressing his mouth hard into mine. There we were, standing in the cold stream, exchanging hot kisses. I explored not just his lips, but his smell, the feeling of his skin, the shape of his shoulder blades, the warmth of his back, of his neck. After a while, I broke off and laid my head against his shoulder, one arm still around him. I looked down at the cool, steady flowing water, moving along its ordained course. That coroner's report, I said to Lee. Yes. We were talking about reason and emotion. Yes. Have you ever known emotion dealt with so coldly as in that report? No, I don't think I have. I turned more so that I could nuzzle into his chest and I whispered, I don't want to end up like a coroner's report. No. He stroked my hair, then felt up under it and squeezed the back of my neck softly, like a massage. After a few more minutes, he said, let's get out of this creek. I'm freezing by slow degrees. It's up to my knees and rising. I giggled. Let's go quickly then. I wouldn't like it to get any higher. Back in the clearing, it was obvious that something had happened between Homer and Fee. Homer was sitting against a tree with Fee curled up against him. Homer was looking out across the clearing to where one of Satan's steps loomed high in the distance. They weren't talking. When we arrived, they got up and wandered over. Homer a little self-consciously, Fee quite naturally. But as I watched them a little during the rest of the afternoon, not spying, just with curiosity to see what they were like, I felt that they were different to us. They seemed more nervous with each other, a bit like 12-year-olds on their first date. Fee explained it to me when we managed to sneak off on our own for a quick goss. He's so down on himself, she complained. Everything I say about him, he brushes off or puts himself down. Do you know? She looked at me with her big, innocent eyes. He's got some weird thing about my parents being solicitors and living in that stupid big house. He always used to joke about it, especially when we went there the other night. But I don't think it's really a joke to him at all. Oh, Fee, how long did it take you to work that out? Why? Has he said something to you? She instantly became terribly worried in her typical Fee way. I was a bit caught because I didn't. I wanted to protect Homer and I didn't want to break any confidences. So I tried to give a few hints. Well, your lifestyle's a bit different to his. And you know the kind of bloke he's always knocked around with at school? They'd be more at hanging out at the milk bar than playing croquet with your parents. My parents don't play croquet. No, but you know what I mean. Oh, I don't know what to do. He seems scared to say anything in case I laugh at him or look down my nose at him, as if I ever would. It seems so funny that he's like that when he's so confident with everything else. I sighed. If I could understand Homer, I'd understand all guys. 
It was getting dark and we had to start organising for a big night, starting with another hike up Satan's steps. I was tired and not very keen to go, especially as Lee wouldn't be able to come. His leg was still stiff and sore. When the time came, I trudged off behind Homer and Fee, too weak to complain. I thought I'd feel guilty if I did. But gradually the sweetness of the night air revived me. I began to breathe it in more deeply and to notice a silent mountain standing gravely around. The place was beautiful. I was with my friends and they were good people. We were coping okay with tough circumstances. There were a lot of things to be unhappy about, but but somehow the papers I'd read in the hermit's hut and the long, beautiful kiss with Lee had given me a better perspective on life. I knew it wouldn't last, but I tried to enjoy it while it did. At the land, we were set about constructing a new hideaway for the vehicles so that they'd be better concealed from anyone using the track. It wasn't easy to do, and in the end we had to be content with a spot behind some trees, nearly a k further down the hill. Its big advantage was that to drive in there you had to go over rocks, which meant no tracks would be left as long as the tyres were dry. Its big disadvantage was that it gave us a longer walk to get into hell, and it was a long enough walk already. Fee and Homer were going to wait up there for the other four, whom we were expecting back from Wirrawee at about dawn, but I didn't want to leave Lee at the campsite on his own for the night. So, for that charitable reason, and no other, I filled a backpack to the brim, took a bag of clothes in my hand, and, laden like a truck, put myself into four-wheel drive and trekked back into hell on my own. It was about midnight when I left Fee and Homer. They said they were going to stretch out in the back of the Land Rover for a few hours, sleep while they waited. That's what they said they were going to do anyway. The moon was up, well up by the time I left. The rock stood out quite brightly along the thin ridge of Taylor's Stitch. A small bird suddenly flew out of a low tree ahead of me with a yowling cry and a clatter of wings. Bushes formed shapes like goblins and demons waiting to pounce. The path straggled between them. If a tailor had stitched it, he must have been mad or possessed or both. White dead wood gleamed like bones ahead of me and my feet scrunched the little stones in the gravel. Perhaps I should have been frightened walking there alone in the dark. But I wasn't. I couldn't be. The cool night breeze kissed my face all over, all the time, and the smell of the wattle gave a faint sweetness to the air. This was my country. I felt like I'd grown from its soil like the silent trees around me, like the springy, tiny leaf plants that lined the track. I wanted to get back to Lee, to see his serious face again, and those brown eyes that charmed me when they were laughing, and helped me by my heart when they were grave. But I also wanted to stay here forever. If I stayed much longer, I felt that I could become part of the landscape, myself a dark, twisted, fragrant tree. I was walking very slowly, wanting to get to Lee, but not too quickly. I was hardly conscious of the weight of the supplies I was carrying. I was remembering how a long time ago, it seemed like years I'd been thinking about this place, hell, and how only humans could have given it such a name. Only humans knew about hell. They were the experts on it. I remembered wondering if humans were hell. The hermit, for instance, whatever happened that terrible Christmas Eve, whether he'd committed an act of great love or an act of great evil. But that was the whole problem, that as a human being he could have done either, and he could have done both. Other creatures didn't have this problem. They just did what they did. I didn't know if the hermit was a saint or a devil, but once he'd fired those two shots, it seemed that he and the people around him had sent him into hell. They sent him there, and he sent himself there. He didn't have to trek all the way across to these mountains into this wild basin of heat and rock and bush. He carried hell with him, as we all did like a little load on our backs that we hardly noticed most of the time, like a huge great hump of suffering that bent us over with its weight. I too had blood on my hands, like the hermit. Just as I couldn't tell whether his actions were good or bad, so too I couldn't tell what mine were. Had I killed killed out of love of my friends, or as part of a noble crusade to rescue friends and family and keep our land free? Or had I killed because I valued my life above that of others? Would it be okay for me to kill a dozen others to keep myself alive? A hundred? A thousand? At what point did I condemn myself to hell if I hadn't already done so? The Bible just said, Thou shalt not kill, then told hundreds of stories of people killing each other and becoming heroes, like David with Goliath. That didn't help me much. I didn't feel like a criminal, but I didn't feel like a hero either. I was sitting on a rock on top of Mount Martin, thinking about all this. The moon was so bright I could see forever. Trees and boulders and even the summits of other mountains cast giant black shadows across the ranges. But nothing could be seen of the tiny humans who crawled like bugs over the landscape, committing their monstrous and beautiful acts. I could only see my own shadow thrown across a rock by the moon behind me. People, shadows, good, bad, heaven, hell, 
All of these were names, labels, that was all. Humans had created these opposites. Nature recognised no opposites. Even life and death weren't opposites in nature. And he was merely an extension of the other. All I could think of to do was to trust to instinct. That was all I had, really. Human laws, moral laws, religious laws. They seemed artificial and basic, almost childlike. I had a sense within me, often not much more than a striving, to find the right thing to do. I had to have faith in that sense. Call it anything. Instinct, conscious, imagination. But what it felt like was a constant testing of everything I did against some kind of boundaries within me. Checking. Checking all the time. Perhaps war criminals and mass murderers did the same checking against the same boundaries and got the encouragement they needed to keep going down the path they had taken. Then how could I know that I was different? I got up and walked around slowly, around the top of Mount Martin. This was really hurting my head, but I had to stay with it. I felt I was close to it, that if I kept my grip on it, didn't let go, I might just get it out, drag it out of my begrudging brain. And yes, I could think of one way in which I was different. It was confidence. The people I knew who thought brutal thoughts and acted in brutal ways, the racists, the sexists, the bigots, never seemed to doubt themselves. They were always so sure that they were right. Mrs Olsen at school, who gave out more detentions than the rest of the staff put together and kept complaining about standards in the school and the lack of discipline among these kids. Mr Rod, down the road from us, who could never keep a worker for more than six weeks. He'd gone through 14 in two years because they were all lazy or stupid or insolent. Mr and Mrs Nelson, who drove their son five kilometres from home every time he did something wrong and dropped him off and made him walk home again then chucked him out for good when he was 17 and they found the syringes in his bedroom. These were the ones I thought of as the ugly people. And they did seem to have one thing in common, a perfect belief that they were right and others wrong. I almost env- envied them the strength of their beliefs. It must have been made life so much easier for them. Perhaps my lack of confidence, my tortuous habit of questioning and doubting everything I said or did, was a gift, a good gift, something that made life painful in the short run, but in the long run might lead to... What? The meaning of life? At least it might give me some chance of working out what I should or shouldn't do. All this thinking had tired me out more than the work hiking up and down the mountains. The moon was shining brighter than ever, but I couldn't stay. I got up and went down the rocks to the gum tree and the start of the trail. When I got back to the campsite, I was disgusted to find Lee sound asleep. I could hardly blame him, considering how late it was, but I'd been looking forward all evening to seeing him and talking to him again. After all, It had been his fault that I'd been going through this mental sweat session. He'd started it with his talk about my head and my heart. Now I had to console myself with crawling into his tent and sleeping next to him. The only consolation was that he would wake in the morning and find he had slept with me and not even known it. I was thinking I was still smiling about that when I fell asleep. Ali and Lee have discovered documents in the hermit's hut that show he wasn't convicted of the murders of his wife and son that he likely killed his family to spare them suffering. Do you think he was innocent or guilty? Join me again in the next episode for Chapter 17 of Tomorrow When the War Began.